What is Bitcoin good for? Welcome to another episode of Understanding the Potential of Bitcoin. My name is Nikolai and we are still talking about this book, The Bitcoin Standard by Dr. Seyfedin Amuz. And right now we're in the second chapter about Bitcoin, which is chapter nine of the book. And the chapter is entitled, What is Bitcoin good for? We could also ask, what are the use cases for Bitcoin? And Dr. Amuz names four distinct categories, four things that Bitcoin's, Bitcoin is good for. Number one, it is good as a store of value. What does that mean? Well, we usually value things that are scarce. If there's something that is really scarce in nature or it's scarce in our society, we value it because we know that people cannot just easily make more of it. Therefore, the supply is limited and therefore it's valuable to us. So historically, mostly this has been gold because it's uh, the hardest thing to produce more of. Pro pro if you put it in percentage wise, usually gold is only produced one or two percent of the existing stockpile all around the world. One or two percent of that existing stockpile is added every year. So that's really, really low. Um, we call that a stock to flow ratio. So there is a stock of existing stuff, gold, silver, copper, aluminum, whatever. And then there is a flow of new production. And if that flow is very low relative to what is already existent, then the good is very scarce. So there is a misunderstanding as um, Dr. Amus elaborates in the beginning that scarcity is actually only relative in material resources with the differences in cost of extraction being the determinant of the level of scarcity. So actually what that means is things are not really limited uh, in their um, availability. What is actually limited is the time that we humans have. And if we would all, every human being in the whole world, would try to start um, mining gold, we would actually um, increase the supply of gold pretty drastically. So gold is only relatively scarce. What the only really thing scarce in the world is um, uh, human time. And uh, that has fundamentally changed uh, with Bitcoin. Um, one could say that um, Bitcoin is pretty much the only thing that exists in the whole uh, universe. <laughs> okay, that's maybe a little exaggerated, but it's the only thing invented where we know that the supply cannot be increased, no matter how much human time we put into it. So almost every other resource in, in, the, in the world, if we try more, we would actually get more, like even oil and all that stuff. There are studies about that. But with Bitcoin, the supply is limited to 21 million. There cannot be more than 21 million, which has technical reasons. And I can explain that in a different video. What does that mean? We know that no matter how high the demand, there will not be more supply coming in. Therefore, it is a great store of value. If you want to uh, save the um, value you generated through your labor, through your work, um, you make some money and you put it in Bitcoin because you don't want to use it right away, you can be pretty sure that it will hold its value for a long time because the price of Bitcoin will probably not decrease because it is very, very scarce. And uh, gold has proven that for thousands of years that because it is that scarce, not because it's shiny or because it has a uh, certain look to it, um, but because it's scarce, the chemistry of gold makes it scarce. Um, because of that, it holds its ver value really, really well. And people are prognost um, prognosticating, like they are um, guessing that this will happen with Bitcoin as well. And it's already happening. Um, which is kind of interesting. I just want to say that since the first video um, in February, Bitcoin price has risen 100%, more than 100%. So even as we do this series, we see that people start to understand the value of Bitcoin because they start to understand that the supply is actually limited. There is no central authority that can change that. There is nobody who can change the code. There is nobody who can um, alter uh, the supply rate. And as much as people understand that, or the more the people understand that, the more trust they will get into the security of that 
um, store of value and they will in, uh, put more money into it and therefore the price will rise. Okay, then um, store of value, that's number one. What is Bitcoin good for? Number two, individual sovereignty. Well, what does that mean? Dr. Amuse writes, individuals have a clear techn technical solution to escape the financial clout of the governments they live under. So basically, this is the first time that Bitcoin holders can send large amounts of value across the planet without having to ask for the permission of anyone. So this has to do with freedom, that governments right now through the central bank system, there is always a third party involved, no matter which transaction you're doing, except for cash, but cash is limited to being at the same space. So if you're not at the same space, but you want to transfer money to somebody in China, there will always be a middleman involved. And that means that middleman has control over those transaction transactions. He knows about those transactions and he can, of course, affect those transactions. And then the central bank system in itself, of course, is a huge, huge influence on your uh, sovereignty and freedom because the central bank um, can decide to increase the supply of fiat money and uh, therefore um, lower the value of the wealth you hold. Through Bitcoin, you get back sovereignty. There is no third party that can confiscate it. There is no third party that can crash it. Actually, if they will try to prohibit Bitcoin or whatever, it will just increase the price because um, people will realize that Bitcoin is valuable in that it can't be stopped because it's spread around all uh, countries in the world. It's spread around computers in every country. It's, it's millions of nodes. It's different. It's a network. And so you can't stop it. The more somebody will try to stop it, the more people real, will realize that you can stop it. And therefore, the value will become even more apparent. So I'm not scared of anybody saying oh, we will stop Bitcoin or something like that. Um, so, uh, and, and he, he um, compares Bitcoin a little bit to something like Uber or Airbnb, um, which subvert government restrictions and regulations um, by just starting something completely new, grassroots movement kind of style, and not uh, top down. That individual sovereignty means that uh, the final piece in the puzzle of digitization um, that has been missing was the transfer of money and value. So through the information uh, revolution, internet and uh, computers, we got a lot more freedom, right? Like we could transfer information all across the world. The censorship is pretty much not possible, except uh, if you censor the internet, but that is also limited. But we have access to so much information. We can do a lot of things that people in the centuries before couldn't do. And uh, the only thing, that was not really revolutionized uh, through that technology was um, the transfer of money and value. And that has actually changed with Bitcoin now, that um, there is a sovereignty in how you want to transact, how you want to store your value, who you want to transact with. And there is no third party that can shut down your bank account, that can determine um, and look, uh, yeah, whatever, or actually not even give you a bank account which is the case for many, many people in many, for example, South East, uh, Eastern, um, South Asia countries. All right. So uh, another thing is, of course, the state enforced banking monopolies, which is what we have right now, um, are getting under huge pressure, um, pressure. And um, there is uh, a sovereignty that Bitcoin provides that undermines the power of those central banks and their monopoly status. The third use case, the third thing Bitcoin is good for is international and online settlement. What does that mean? Well, when you transact with somebody else during the day and you send John $5 and he sends you back $10 and you send back $15 or whatever, the bank is not actually uh, settling every single transaction with the bank of John. They will just collect all the transactions that have happened between your bank, let's say Nico Bank and John Bank. They will just collect all those um, 
uh, tra transactions of the day or of the week. And then once a day or once a week, they will settle between your bank and his bank all those transactions once with one big chunk of money that either you get from that bank or they give the bank. So that is basically um, what happens with Bitcoin. You have the possibility of um, final settlement payments with Bitcoin, which are uh, forever recorded on the blockchain. So I don't even think, or Dr. Moose doesn't really think that the main use case is like paying for a cup of coffee with Bitcoin. Those will be second layer solutions through maybe like Lightning Network or something like that. The main solution, uh, the main thing with Bitcoin is that um, with Bitcoin you have the possibility to um, uh, bring, bring the finality of cash settlement to the digital world. So right when you have a cash interaction, you give um, the guy at the bakery uh, two euros for your pretzel and uh, whatever, a coffee, then that transaction is final, it's settled. When you do the same thing digitally and you send something through PayPal, it's actually not settled. The two banks have to still uh, collect all those transactions and when, only when they have um, in exchanged the money, then the, the uh, transaction is final. What you have in Bitcoin is that as soon as the transaction is recorded on the blockchain, the transaction is final. So for the first time ever, you have what you have in physical cash interactions on the digital level. And that is a revolution. And the great thing about it is now that can happen between central banks. They can now use Bitcoin as a final settlement exchange medium. And that is, of course, a lot cheaper than moving gold around or um, uh, doing, yeah, like gold is what, what it used to be. Um, so that is uh, a huge use case. So you can uh, verify it cryptographically secured and um, the final settlement of large volume payments within minutes. That is what the network can offer. So that is also part of the reason why Dr. Amuse calls the book the decentralized alternative to central banking um, because he says this will change the whole central banking system uh, upside down. That the only banks that will survive in the long run will be banks offering final financial instruments 100% backed by Bitcoin. So the same way the dollar was backed by gold until 1971 when Nixon changed that, before that, you could just a dollar was just a receipt for gold. So you could always go to somewhere and get uh, give that dollar bill, and you would have to get back some gold for it. But he changed that. So since that um, time, 1971, gold is backed. Uh, our currency is backed by nothing. But he will say that with Bitcoin, banks will offer uh, financial instruments 100% backed by Bitcoin again and that um, people will want that because they want the security of um, their uh, investments being actually valuable and that is only the case if they are backed by something which is scarce. Okay, so um, he thinks that Bitcoin will become a reserve currency for a new form of central bank and I think that is it. The last and fourth use case is as a global unit of account. So what does that mean? Well, if everybody thinks for a second, like how it, how it used to be when gold was the main medium of exchange, you didn't have a foreign exchange trade market. Like not every country had their, their own... Uh, uh, currency. You basically just had different names for different amounts of gold that that currency was related to, but it was all on the gold standard. So you could do international trade really easily. The, you had the same unit of account. You could measure how much something is worth in China because they would measure it in gold and um, you, how much that piece of wood is worth in China compared to how much that piece of wood is worth in Germany um, because you had the same unit of account. So if you have those different currencies in different countries and then you have fluctuating prices of these currencies, of course you don't have a stable unit of account. You don't know how much stuff is worth and therefore you can't calculate, therefore international trade is really difficult, therefore the economy cannot really function like it could. 
And that is one of the offerings that Bit or one of the things Bitcoin offers that if it is because it can be used worldwide because it's digital and everybody has access to the internet, um, it can be it can function as a unit of account. And that will actually happen um, when Bitcoin is widely adopted. That is pretty much the last thing that usually happens, but that will function as a great way of facilitating international trade and making things easier for businesses. All right, those were the four use cases. So store of value, sovereignty, international settlements, and unit of account. I'm sure there are many, many more, but I think that is basically uh, a, summar a summary of what he thinks are the major ones. And I'm very happy and interested uh, to hear about your opinions. What do you think about it? And I see you soon. Bye-bye.